Welcome to Wine Soundtrack International. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Alison Levine, and today I'm with Maria Otero. She is with Bodegas Martin Codex, and that is um, out of the Riesch Baixas in northern Spain. I, I think, Maria, you can do a much better job pronouncing that and telling us. So tell us a little bit about where you're located and about Martin Codex. So hello, everybody. First of all, thank you for having me here, for, having, <laughs> for giving me the opportunity to explain you a little bit more about my little tiny but beautiful area <laughs> in the world. It's true, Rias Baixas can be struggling to pronounce, but Alison, no problem. The <laughs> Spanish people, they don't even know how to pronounce that because it's Galician language. Sometimes the X is kind of difficult for yes. them. But uh, we are in the region called Galicia which is located in the northwest corner of Spain, right above Portugal, just by the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. Ah. So um, the very top of Spain, small little region. Um, tell me a little bit about Martin Codex. Martin Codex is such a great project. Um, when I'm asked, just describe the project with a sentence. This sentence is Martin Codex is a winery made by people for people. Uh, it started with a group of 50, 50 growers. For me, they were really ahead of their time because mid-80s, they realized the jewel they had in their vineyards, all the potential of the Albrino grapes. And they decided to work together to found a winery, so a cooperative. They were right because nowadays, after 34 years, we are more than 600 families being part of the project. Wow. And so 600 families um, producing exclusively or primarily Albarino? It's true. In Rias Baixas, in the region, there's other indigenous white varietals permitted by the appellation, but our growers, it's 100% Albarino. It's the queen. The queen. Now, you were telling me that um, the the region is a very matriarchal region that it it gets passed down and um, everyone has small properties. So with all the vineyards that you're working with, another it's a cooperative and with all the growers, um, these are all families, right? Right. Yes. Um, it's a very special region in terms of how you get the land, the property of the land. We follow pretty much the same system as in Burgundy. The land is kept in the family, generation after generations, equally divided. Doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl. And at the moment, it's like uh, 600 families, more than 3,500 plots. And it's a challenge, but it's very exciting at the same time. Same region, same grape, a lot of blood, so all the potential in your hands to make beautiful wines. Wow. And how how much wine are you guys producing a year? And is it just Albarino? Um, Martin Cores mainly 100% is Albarino, but it's true that within the project, there are other wineries where we produce other wines. For example, available in the United States, we have a red blend made, made of different red indigenous varieties of Spain. Okay. And the wines are available all over the world? Yeah, we're happy. Thanks God. It came a reality because it was, um, since the very beginning, that was a kind of goal for us to have the one available domestically, but also outside of our borders. Pretty much at the moment, we are 60% of our productions is domestic market and 40% the wines that are available in more than 55 countries in the world. Mm. And so you are the child of one of these families, yes, of the, of the members of the association. And then you also work for the cooperative. Um, what is your first memory relevant to wine? Well, actually, I think that when you grew up uh, in a wine region and uh, in your family, you have been yours. The first memory is, and especially in my region, because there's a good combination because it's the ocean and it's the vineyards. And then the harvest, it happens mid late September. So my memories is like, you know, having fun in the ocean, summertime. And then you realize that 
just before going back to school, it was the harvest moment. And that's my first memories, you know, that time, September is a beautiful month of the of the year, you know, picking the grapes with your family, all your family together, which is important because mm -hmm. all the family comes together to make the harvest. So it's wow. good because it's family thin and it's fantastic. I, sometimes it's hard for me to get the words to describe that, but it's a really good memory because it's all your family together doing the same thing, having a good time, enjoying. Oh. That's a lovely sediment. <laughs> so what is one of the most memorable wines that you've drunk and what was the occasion that sort of changed your perspective on wine and maybe opened up your eyes to something new, whether at the beginning of your career or, you know, as you've been growing in it? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I'm come from a white wine region and I, um, It really blew up my mind when I first started to work in the winery. I was tasting the whole range and I, I was said, you know what, our grape, the Alvarino, is like a rough diamond. Depending on how you vinificate it, you can get completely different, amazing things. And then uh, through tasting, I tasted our late harvest Alvarino. And uh, it's, it's completely something very unique because it's not a proper late harvest but it's late harvest because it's got 80% noble rot mm -hmm. but it's something that is like the aromatic is completely different to the palate so it's so unique that it's like in all my career I've not find a so surprising wine wow I want to try that <laughs> so if we were to um come to your home in your cellar what would we be find in there what what do you drink on a regular basis just local wines or do you have anything else from anywhere else well to be honest on a regular basis is local wine is our wines uh but also i i like to have you know different things in order to have an open mind always want to discover new stuff and mm, unknown regions that uh, doesn't matter if it is red or white or rosé. it's true that in my cellar part of that is local wine and domestic wine domestically speaking in spain but also different stuff in different countries anything in particular actually that's true uh the last thing i got it was um i was visiting uh, the south of italy puglia and the last the uh, different stuff I got it was Primitivo and Negro Amaro from that region mm. Mm. so you're obviously very particular to Alvarino as a grape but do you think it's a perfect variety or do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety <laughs> to be honest I've got to say that for me it's a perfect variety but you know what it's like each single grape is perfect in so many different ways depending on how you work with that what you want to have but for me the Alvarino it's, uh, it's got a lot of potential it's one of the few white grapes in the world where you can get good acidity good residual sugar good alcohol potential and with that you can make many different styles, many different things. So it's beautiful and it's perfect. Mm. And then how do you approach food and wine pairing? Um, obviously, um, we were drinking in Alvarino last night and it was beautiful with um, the dish that we had and with seafood. But do you think there are rules to follow or do you think that there are, you know, you can be a little more playful? My point of view is just to be open mind. Let the food and wine this surprises you because sometimes it's like you cannot imagine that certain dish goes very well with a certain wine and you just try it together and it's like oh my goodness that's heaven so I think that it's like um, just give it a try mm -hmm. maybe it works maybe it doesn't and maybe you have the surprise of the day just open mind and try something different it's not you know that 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 classical thought of white wines is gonna be fish or seafood red wines is gonna be meat no why not there's hundred thousand different reds and whites in the world just why fixing the pairings right it can be boring yeah absolutely and what about for you red white or rosé white 
<laughs> Still are sparkling. Ah, uh, oof, that's 50-50. 50-50. <laughs> Why should you have to choose, right? <laughs> Still. 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 <laughs> Do you ever make a sparkling Alvarino? Yes, we do. Ah, yeah. So. You know what? It's like, as I told you, it's like a, it's like diamond. You know, it's like, and it's got the perfect conditions to make beautiful sparkling. Following, you know, the not following, but being closer to the champagne meth style with the traditional method, proper aging, and it's beautiful because it's, it's got the bright acidity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. How do you approach wine critics and scores? Where do you see them fitting into the wine world? And what's your opinion? <sighs> you know, for some people, it's helpful. Because if you don't know anything about wine, can give you an idea of, well, maybe this wine has got a good score. Well, let's give it a try. But uh, at the end of the day, I think that um, doesn't matter if a wine has a good score or not, can be beautiful as well. And so for me, it's helpful. Some critics, they're very good. Others, is, there's like, depending on the personal point of view of the person who's behind the critic. So I would say that it's fine, but just for the general consumer, give it a try to any wine that you want to try. Maybe you get the surprise of your life mm-hmm. and it doesn't have any kind of <laughs> score. Absolutely. Not necessarily. Yeah. So, if space aliens were to land on your property, which of the wines, if they've never had your wine, would you want to introduce them to? Uh, <laughs> that's a super <laughs> funny question. <laughs> imagine the situation in my mind is like hello welcome to the wine <laughs> no of course it would be Martin Coras because um, Martin Coras for me it's uh, the best expression of the Albarino grape in the Rio Spicious region so it would be no question I have any doubt it would be Martin Coras and they will automatically learn what does it mean an Albarino wine mm-hmm. and Martin Codex um, is the name of a person but it's not a name of a living person. What What is the story behind the name Martin Codex that the cooperative picked that up? Um, I like the story of the name because um, it comes back to the 50 founders of the wineries. Uh, they, they had an idea of telling the people the story of the region where the grape is born. And they decided to pick a name that tells a little bit about the history of the region, the culture of the region. So Martin Coras, true, he was a person, he was a kind of poet and singer who lived in the area in the 13th century, and at that time, so many centuries ago, and his poems and his songs, he wrote about the Albarino grape. So nowadays, 21st century, from our romantic point of view, is the best proof we have that you know, the grape has always been in the region and Martin Cotas wrote about it. So now drink a <laughs> glass of vino. Perfect name. <laughs> so for somebody who hasn't had the pleasure to taste the Martin Codex Albarino or an Albarino yet um, from Galicia, what do you think they're missing out on? Wow. <laughs> uh, they're missing something... Um, for me, it's always good memories when I have a glass of wine. Good memories related to the place I live and the place I was born. For me, they're missing, you know, that sunny, that that, that feeling when the sunny, when the sun touches your face, the breeze of the ocean, you can feel it. It's all about brightness, freshness. Um, I always normally describe it like a splash of the ocean on your palate all the freshness, mm. the powerful, yeah. Mm. Mm. It's making me thirsty. It's making me want to go to the beach right now. <laughs> so, um, you know, we talk about every vintage telling a different story and you've grown up with a vineyard, I'm sure, in your backyard. Do you see more similarities year after year or do you see more difference from each vintage to vintage? It's true that something is happening, uh, talking about the climate and the weather, 
I don't know if the perfect word is global warming or is it just cycles, I don't know, but when you work so close to the mother nature, you realize. But the real challenge for the wineries is to keep the consistency, to keep the typicity and to maintain the style in terms of to be honest with ourselves making the wine and with our customers. Mm. And so for you, um, do you go back home and harvest with your family every year? And if so, do you have any traditions that your family does at the beginning or during or at the end of harvest? You know, there's, this is not my families. I think this is all families in the families in the region. It's like you, you are the all day harvesting. And after that, we make what we call in the Spanish merienda together. It's like just after to finish your harvest day, it's a, all together, we get some kind of food, very easy finger food and a glass of wine. But in the winery, what we do in order to celebrate our babies, the grapes, <laughs> they're safe at home. Uh, right after harvest, we make a lunch, all the families together. Ah, it's a big lunch. It is a big lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> you said that it was... Um, 600 families and like 3,500 plots of land in a in a small region. I don't know how many people live in your region, but that's like half the town probably. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think in the town where uh, the the closer town to the winery is Cambados, and I'm not so sure, but it's something in between 15,000. 20,000 people living in the town. Yes, you know what? It's, you can feel it in the town. When when it happens, the harvest is like you go to the supermarket, it's empty. Uh, you go to any kind of grocery store and it's empty. It's like, you know, when the time stops and everybody is 100% involved and committed with harvest. Oh. So when you were a little girl, what did you want to be when you grew up? I, you know, I don't remember that, but my mom tells me that I wanted to be a teacher ah. and he bought me, you know, uh, a blackboard uh -huh. and I tell the lessons to, you know, my <laughs> little sister and my friends. I don't have that memory, but she tells me. <laughs> and then what did you study and what were you looking to do? How did you end up in wine? I mean, aside from growing up in, in vineyards. You know, um, I went to the university, I took my studies, but um, after the studies, it was like, uh, I don't know exactly what to do, you know, because sometimes you go to the university, you take your studies, it's okay, you have the degree, but it's like, what do I want to do in my life for mm -hmm. a living? And I remember that my man once told me that you need to, you need to feel committed with your job and you need to be passionate about it. So at that time, uh, it came to my mind um, one harvest with my grandfather. He was very worried because all his great children, we were girls. And he was worried about who's going to happen with your generation, who's going to be in church of the vineyards. So at that time, I thought, well, I can have the opportunity to keep on living in the area where I want to live. That's something that I, I'm sure about it. I want to live where I live. And I can have the opportunity to keep on the family business. And I can have the opportunity to let the people know this beautiful kept secret we have in Galicia. Tell us stories not only about the wine, about the region, about the people, about the culture. So I thought, I have the perfect place since <laughs> I was a child. So. I went to the winery, knock on the doors, and I tell them, you know what, I want to work here. Anything you want me to do, I'm available, because I know this is the place where I want to develop my career. And how how many years have you been there now? 13 years 13 ago. 13 years. So at least they let you work for free at first. Yes, it's <laughs> true. It's true. For the first six months, they told me, mm, well, um, we're not sure, sure if there's any kind of position available. And I told him, no problem, I work for free. <laughs> so when you're not working, what do you do for your free time or for fun? Um, uh, when I'm not working, it's like, um, as I told you, I love the place where I live. You know, it's right by the ocean. I consider my 
yourself a notion person. Doesn't matter if it is summer or winter, it's beautiful to have a walk in the beach, to smell the aroma of the ocean. I also like to stay with my uh, friends, um, family and friends, you know, to, to share good quality moments with persons you love. That's, mm -hmm. For me, it's perfect. Yeah. And as a Spaniard, do you have a team that you follow? Uh, that's a good question, because you know I come from a little re region <laughs> called Galicia. We have a beautiful soccer team, <laughs> and it's the one the one that I support. And what is their name? Um, their name, well, actually, it's uh, there's more than one soccer uh -huh. team, but I support the Deportivo de la Coruña. Ah, and are they a, a good team? Well, <laughs> should it be a good team? Actually, they were within the top three in the country. Now they're struggling, but you know, there's always kind of faces. <laughs> so when they go through another phase and, and they win and they're back at the top of the field, um, if they were to get a celebratory wine from you, which wine would you present to them to... No question. It's got to be Martin Coras. The label <laughs> white and blue, you know, their uniform is white and blue. Oh. It's a perfect match. Oh. There's their incentive. Yes. <laughs> they better start playing better. <laughs> um, what was the best piece, piece of advice you've ever received? Do you, do you have one piece of advice that kind of carries you through life? And who was it that gave it to you? To enjoy what you do. Because if you don't enjoy what you do, at the end of the day, it's, it's going to be so sad. I cannot imagine. It's like, it's my mom. She's always telling us, just be yourself, be passionate and enjoy what you do. Otherwise, don't do it because it's not going to be a real thing. And if you could offer advice to our listeners, what would you tell everyone? Uh, that's a tough question because it's <laughs> like, you know, you take your mom's advice, but I'm not a mom yet. <laughs> you know, don't, to give any advice, but it's like, I would say the same advice I was given. Enjoy your life. Take the very best of it. Because it's kind of short. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you look back at your career so far, what would you say is one of your proudest achievements? Actually, uh, to work in the winery, because it's like, I can imagine my grandfather being so proud of myself because you know the family business is kept in the family so it's kind of oh my goodness I've gotten it so that for me is my best goal mm. it's beautiful and especially since he was so worried since he had no grandsons yeah, super worried you cannot imagine <laughs> his face was oh my god <laughs> so complete this sentence for me a table without wine is like a life without love oh. <laughs> and now um, since I know you, you, you've planned this one a little bit but if you could have anyone if the paparazzi were to snap a photo of someone sitting in a restaurant and on that table was a bottle of your wine of your Alperino who would you want that person to be drinking your wine I would love to be Eddie Vedder <laughs> That is not what I expected to hear. <laughs> Any better. Okay. Yes. He loves wine. He needs to try Martin Godas, you know? <laughs> well, hopefully he'll listen to this. Yes. Fingers crossed. Eddie, please <laughs> give it a chance. <laughs> so when, when we think about, um, you know, the future, if there was one place in this world that you could travel next to, What's on your bucket list in your future? Uh, New Zealand. I've never oh. been to New Zealand, and it's a white wine country producer, and I think it's going to be beautiful. So I want to visit New Zealand. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. So before you go to New Zealand, I'm sending you to a deserted island. Okay. <laughs> and I want you to tell me what three wines you would take with you. I, only three. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you, you know, I won't, I won't tell anyone if you sneak a fourth one on. Okay, <laughs> I'll take the late harvest of Martin Coras, Martin Coras Galicia, because it's just, you know, it, it's been so surprising for me. Um, I'm a white person, so I'll take two whites and one red, just Fair in enough. any case. Of course, I'll take uh, Martin Coras Albino. Even in a desert island, I want to feel like at home. <laughs> and um, 
being from the northwest corner of Spain, to be honest, I'll take the red we make there. The grape is called Mencia. Mencia? Hmm. I'm okay. a kind of homesickness person. I know, you're drinking your own wine. Yeah. Like, so Mencia, Albarino, and late harvest Albarino. So now, oh, can. Yeah. you know the game wine and music we're gonna pair it i think you can do it this is easy these are such lively and fun wines there's got to be but you know what i'm kind of um they're lively they're beautiful but in some way it's like uh they can have their romantic way as well so the so so in terms of music tell me you want to start with the mencia Yes. What would you What would you want to listen to as you sip that Mencia? Rock song, <laughs> because the Mencia has got a lot of personality. You know, by Eddie that. Vedder. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? You're telling me that I I have the I have the song in my mind. Is like um, before Pearl Jam, Eddie Vedder played a song together with um, ah, how is it called? Um, Another rock singer in order to make a tribute to a group from Seattle. Uh, the lead singer of Soundgarden. They make a uh-huh. song. This song is beautiful and it goes very well with Menthea. Perfect. So, um, Albarino, the Martin Codex Albarino, the one that uh, we were sipping with the white and blue label. <laughs> <sighs> Talking about music, I like pretty much the same style of music. So, I will love to have a glass of Martin Cotas Albarino with a song that I do really like. It's called Brewster. It's from Alice in Chains, New Seattle. <laughs> you and your rock music. Yes. <laughs> okay, so now I want to know for the wine that sort of opened your eyes to Albarino, late harvest Albarino, what would you want to pair with? I'm just anticipating what song this is going to be. <laughs> that's tough. That's the toughest. That's why it's like, I don't know, because that, that wine is so kind of surprising that maybe Jeff Buckley's. Okay. You're a little rocker. <laughs> but I don't know why. <laughs> No, but I mean, you know, look, everyone has a different view of what they'd want to drink. And it isn't always, it isn't to one person rock, another person jazz, another, you know, that's why it's so beautiful because you, you get different sensations and yes. wine, wine ha- gives people different sensations. And so. it's true because for example, that's my opinion. <laughs> it's like, I think that the best romantic songs in the world, they were made by rock bands. So it's like, the, you can have everything. <laughs> well, on that romantic note, <laughs> I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And I want you, can you just let us know, can we visit you? Um, and how can we visit you or find your wines? Please do it. <laughs> just come and visit. Um, actually, I think that it's it's very easy. We're open to uh, make a tour in the winery. You have, have our wines here available in the U.S. And then each single corner of Spain might domestic team they do it, such a great job and um, if you come and visit the winery it was built it was just by chance but it was built in a hill and it's got a beautiful viewpoint where you can get the valley with all the vineyards and the sunset in the ocean uh. and that's if you make a tasting at that time of the day late afternoon I promise you will get the freshness salinity character of the Alberini <laughs> Uh, well, I know where I'm planning my next trip <laughs> to Riesch Bacious. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, gracias. Thank you for joining us today. And hopefully we'll see you in Spain. Hopefully so. Thank you so much. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack International. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.